Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of our friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. If I could change things now, I would... I wouldn't have let him go. I wouldn't have let him go. I would have made him stay for dinner. I would have made him stay for dinner and I would have said to him to make arrangements for another day. We've counted 180 CCTV cameras along Noah's route. And as far as we know from the police, there's only about 22 cameras that have Noah on footage. My child was still missing. Nobody knew where Noah was, and they didn't even take her to the police station and ask her questions about how that laptop came to be in her bedroom. 6-11 was the last time he was seen that he was naked um, and he was running, he was exhausted and it was, he was running exhausted naked. Just, and I have to stress, it's just a minority and there's always a minority and either side, Catholic and Protestant, are very racist. Um, um, <laughs> How did my baby know that storm drain existed and also know that the storm drain was unlocked? How did my baby know that? If they tell me that, if they prove to me that, then I will, and I've said to everybody, I will start listening to what they're saying, but it doesn't make sense to me. You know, no one deserves, no one deserves the truth. I believe somebody harmed my baby. I believe somebody harmed my baby. I just don't want to think about it. But I think the police believe that that's what the outcome would be if the if um if a truth came out that paramilitaries were involved. And we're on. And today's guest, we've got Fiona Donahoe. How are you, Fiona? Okay, I'm good. Thanks for thanks for speaking with me, James. Yeah, we've been speaking quite a bit, and um, we just feel as if it's time now to try and shed more light on your son Noah, who yeah. was sadly taken from you. And the twenty first of June, twenty twenty, is that correct? Yeah. There's a lot of unanswered questions, and today you just want to get as much information out there for people to maybe reach out and and give you some closure and, and give you the answers that you need. First and foremost, how are you, Fiona? Um, <clears throat> I tell you the truth, I am angry. I'm angry. Um, I'm sad. And, and just... But uh, the anger spurred me on to get answers for Noah. And that's why I'm sitting with you, James, is to just... Um, to make some sense of what happened and why he's, he never came home on the 21st of June when he should have. I always go back to the start of my guest first, Fiona, get a bit of understanding about you and your life and mm -hmm. um, so we can put all the pieces together and where people can, we can simplify it for a lot of people and people yeah. maybe get your answers that you need. But let's go back to where you were born and where you were raised. Yeah, well, I was brought up in Strabans, County Trona, just on the border um, Donegal, um, yeah, with my family, um, 
for us five of us, five children. I had I left to go to university in Southampton. I didn't finish it. Um, I went on to do other things and then went to America um, um, as a nanny and then looking after elderly. And I became pregnant with Noah, so came back because um, I was illegal over there. So I wanted the best opportunities for Noah and I wouldn't have been able to give that to him over there. Um, I did come back and stay in Japan with Noah for a few years, but my thing was always to um, be a good role model for my son. And so there's not much work in Straban. So when I um, moved, I worked in the civil service for a while. And then when that contract was up, I moved to Belfast. Um, I've worked most of, most of my um, life with Noah and the NHS's administrator, administration. Um, and basically Noah, I thought Belfast was going to be a place where Noah would have opportunities. Um, and it was a place where he enjoyed, like he had, um, he had so many opportunities here. He, he went to grammar school, St. Malky's, which is a great school on the Antrim Road in North Belfast. Um, he made some amazing friends. They're like brothers. They actually were like brothers. I call them the band of brothers now. Um, he excelled. He excelled in school. Like he was getting, got 99% in his Spanish. He was just is brilliant at music. He played the cello. Um, he played basketball and rugby. He's just, um, no, he's just a child that any parent would be so proud to have. Now, I knew I was so blessed with Noah. I used to always say to him how amazing he was. And, um, like, he, he just, he never, ever gave me any baller. He never gave me any baller. He was, just, oh, he was like my wee... He was my soulmate. He is my soulmate. And, and, um, so... How was it in Belfast for you? You know it at the time, so obviously Belfast is it's a tough city. It's a tough place, like... Was everything fine before that? Was it no ever any bother or anything ever happened to him beforehand? Noah never. Noah was uh, a child. He was an academic. He was, um, you know, his his life was learning. His life was learning. Um, I was a single parent. We were in social housing. Noah was mixed race. Um, uh, we kept ourselves to ourselves, Noah's activities, his friends. I went to work and our wee bubble, it was our wee world. Um, through COVID, obviously it was three months into COVID, whenever um, the lockdown was hard, that his, his, his friends and him always kept in contact through um Discord, it's a social media platform where they can FaceTime more or less. Um, and Noah was so excited to meet his friends again, you know, actually give them a hug because we were huggers. We we're huggers as friends. You know, they're they're that close that they, you know, they just loved each other. Where we lived, um, it's called the Holy Lands. It's basically a thoroughfare of like a melting pot of students um, of people that aren't from uh, Belfast aren't from um, Ireland um, and also through COVID there was a hostel that opened up a crisis hostel that was just about a hundred meters away from where Noah and I lived not even a hundred meters. Um, and through COVID, I had noticed a 
crowd of people that started loitering around and that were, they were staying in the hostel, but then they attracted other types of people, friends or whatever. Um, and I had made complaints to the hostel. I had made complaints to the management of the hostel as I, like I just thought that, you know, they were to be a sort of um, crowd. And um, especially there were students around as well, you know, and these people. I just, um, I, I had seen a few things happen outside our apartment and I just didn't, I didn't think, uh, I think th that the management and the police should be taking responsibility for it. Um, um, what kind of stuff? Well, I will say there was um, there was an overdose just outside our apartment, an ambulance. Um, there was, I did see um, drug dealing taking place just outside our apartment. Um, and Noah would never, like it would ne Noah was so laid back. He wouldn't even, you know, he would have said, Mommy, don't worry, don't worry. But, you know, I, that's the type of me. I just like, uh, you know, if you, if you can, if you can um, try and stop something like that happening, you know, then that's what I, I try to take the steps to, um, you know, to maybe stop that happening outside our apartment. I didn't want that around where we were living. Yeah, as a single mother, you want to prevent things from yeah. taking danger away from your son and potentially anything ever happening. Well, it's not even uh, like I never, I knew Noah would never have to, because Noah and I were always together when we went outside the apartment. Like, even if I went to shop, Noah went with me. But um, and our apartment was very well secured. But um, I did, as I said, I did make a few complaints. Um, I will say, like, I'm quite distinctive with my hair, and Noah was very distinctive as well. Um, he was very tall and, as I said, mixed race, and he was always with me. Um, that would have been where we were living at the time. Now, on the 21st of June, Noah had said to me, that he, the day before, actually, I have to say, he went and met his friend Jay for the first time in three months. Um, they went into town, they had a lovely day together. And the next day they had arranged to meet with their other friend, um, who Noah hadn't seen in the three months. Um, they were going to go to Cave Hill, which is a, it's a, beautiful location in North Belfast where just um, uh, up the road from where Noah's school would have been. Um, Noah had on the day that um, Noah went missing, Noah came in and said to me that he was going to um, meet his two friends and go to Cave Hill. And it was um, about half five and I said, I didn't want him to go. He didn't have his dinner. But I knew how much it meant to him seeing his friend the day before and he hadn't seen his other friend. I just thought, what right have I, you know, like to um, stop him meeting his friends after three months of lockdown. But I said to him, you, you have to be back by eight o'clock and... Noah was the type of child, he understood um, how important it was whenever we had made an arrangement to stick to the arrangement, and he always did. He always, always did. I had said to him, right, whenever you get over to um, your friend, you phone me from his phone because Noah didn't have um, money on his phone. And I look back now in hindsight, and I know. Uh, like I like to put out to every parent, you know, things that I look back and I think, you know, I didn't take, I, 
if I could change things now, I would, I wouldn't have let him go. I wouldn't have let him go. I would have made him stay for dinner. I would have made him stay for dinner and I would have said to him to make arrangements for another day. Um, Does that play in your mind every day? Yeah. It's like... And another thing that plays in my mind and this is important for parents is I didn't have his friends' contact numbers. You know, it's just simple things like that where I had said to Noah, right, you should be over there by half six. So um, so you phone me so I know that you're there. Um, and half six, I think it's a mother's instinct. A half six, the... I never got a phone call, and I just uh, thought Noah should have rang me by now. Um, now, it was a bright, sunny day. Um, Noah had cycled over, and I kept ringing Noah's phone, and it was a new phone, it was charged. It, he didn't answer, and um, I don't know, I just thought this isn't Noah for him not to, not to be in contact. He would have known I would worry. Um, so, so Noah le left your house at 5.41? Yeah, he left. Um, he had left, yeah, by 5.30, between 5.35. There's a lot of question marks, like CCTV, police saying, like, no foul play straight away, like... We'll go through the full steps of that day yeah. so people can get an understanding and maybe track. You, you don't know who's watching us to maybe come forward and yeah. help you with some answers. So Noah left yours at 5.41. Yeah. And then you started feeling something was wrong at 6.30 yourself. Do you know what? I I just, like, you don't want to be irrational and overreact, but something just, like, because Noah was such a good child and we made arrangements. I knew whenever I, an hour was more than enough time, an hour was more than enough time for him to go to his destination to meet his friends. Um, and I, uh, like, I, I just thought there's, like, there's something not right. Um, there's CCTV of Noah leaving the apartment. He had a he had a helmet and all on. Um there's CCTV of him. We've counted 180 CCTV cameras along Noah's route. And as far as we know from the police, there's only about 22 cameras that have Noah on footage out of 180. Now if there's a hundred and if there's 180 CCTV cameras and a child is missing, then I expect, and I, I would expect every other parent, they expect to see him, that the police will take every single CCTV camera, knock on the business door, knock on a, like a residential and ask them, can we check your CCTV? You know, there's no amount of money that um, a police resources that can, that, you know, a child is like, it, when a child's missing, you take every step that you have to take. And with the CCTV cameras, they didn't. Um, there's a, on Noah's route through the city centre, there's a blind spot of 180 metres. Now I have to let people know in Belfast, because of the troubles, Belfast is probably the most CCTV city um, in the UK. Uh, I don't even know if, like, as far as Europe or whatever, but in the UK. Um, they don't have trees in the city centre. It's just to, um, so as not to obstruct in case something happens in the city centre. And that's because of the troubles. Now, um, Great Victoria Street is in the city centre and it was on Noah's route and Noah would have taken that route going to school. Um, 
and there's there's no CCTV footage there. Yet, if you go down Great Victoria Street, there's CCTV cameras everywhere. Police CCTV traffic on the on the traffic lights, CCTV and businesses, um, and the police are trying to tell us that there's no CCTV footage there. But keeping that in mind, a witness came forward, um, and she gave a statement our solicitor, a five-page statement saying that she was with a group of men, um, four men. Um, they were drug addicts and that these four men may have attacked Noah and it just so happens that it's in that area where there's 180 metres blind spot of no CCTV. I'll also put out and there's a lot of investment in that area. There's over 700 million pounds of investment in that small area. Um, um, I don't know what, maybe due to such investments, people may not know, may not want it to be known that that's an area where your child could get attacked. There's a university there. There's going to be residential, student residentials, buildings there through investments. And it's a lot of money. And um, I was, um, I put this out on Twitter and I was, um, through my solicitor, a university um, solicitor, got in contact and was going to take me to high court because of me putting that out on Twitter. I'm just stating the fact there's over 700 million pounds investment in that blind spot area. Um, it doesn't look good for investors from overseas, um, for any investors. Um, if there's drug addicts around that area, that may attack, attack a child. Why is there no CCTV there? Oh, there is CCTV cameras. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, later, later on last year, eagle-eyed CCTV operators from the police were able to um, track down um, thieves that stole somebody's wallet in the 180 meter blind spot area where Noah, there's no CCTV of my Noah. Yet they could track down a wallet in that blind spot area through their eagle-eyed CCTV camera operators. So, you know, uh, you know, I am angry and I'm just, I'm just putting out facts um, that, that, that weigh on my mind about, you know, what doesn't weigh up. Was there somebody else attacked a month before Noah went missing? Yes, but that was in a different area. Um, can I first of all say there's so many coincidences around the, the witness and the four men. If you go back to when I said about me complaining about the hostel, Right, um, this is, there's so many coincidences and I want to get to the bottom of these coincidences. Noah had a, Noah went with his rucksack and in the rucksack was a laptop and a few books. Um, where the attack was meant to happen, Noah's rucksack, um, Noah and his rucksack, you know, they were, he didn't he no longer had it in this um 180 meter blind spot um the laptop was in the rucksack the eyewitness who's along with the four men a lady who has been named in the newspapers who's, um the laptop was found in her room and her room, coincidentally, 
is in the hostel that is only a few metres away from where we lived that I had been complaining about. There's CCTV footage of Noah going down past one of the hostels and the, the people that were meant to have attacked Noah, Noah goes down on the bike and they look down as down the road as Noah's gone down on the bike. Now, just because these people um, may not have uh, like an abode, uh, doesn't mean that they don't know people who drive cars. So I'm, I'm just, it may be on one side of the city to another side of the city, but for some reason, these people were on the other side of the city as well. You know, when Noah, is, it doesn't make sense. Um, the the girl who made the statement, her and a gentleman who has been named um, in the newspapers, went and tried to sell Noah's laptop in a pawn shop. It didn't have a charger, so they couldn't sell it. Um, the laptop that was, as I said, was then found in this girl's room. Um, I am going to put it out there that the police went into her room. She was sleeping in the room. They, they searched for the laptop and then they let her go back to sleep or maybe phone friends. They did not arrest her. They did not take her to the police station and question her. And Noah was still missing at this time. My child was still missing. Nobody knew where Noah was and they didn't even take her to the police station and ask her questions about how that laptop came to be in her bedroom. Um, one of the gentlemen, uh, call a gentleman, that was meant to have attacked Noah also lived in that hostel and he moved out of the hostel the day after Noah went missing. Um, was he ever questioned? No, none of these people. We we put the statement, the five-page statement, to the police um, with with a letter um, citing possible manslaughter, and none of these people. Oh gosh, there's been there's been no arrests, only for one person who who was with this girl to sell the laptop. Is that Daryl Paul? Yes, thank you for mentioning. I uh, have a policy of not mentioning names. Yeah, I can mention him. without in the public domain. Yeah. Like he had nearly 200 convictions, is that correct? Um, very violent. Uh, some of them were violent convictions. The thing is, is this is another coincidence and it is confusing because I can't get my head around it at all, is the girl that was with Daryl Paul, as you mentioned, to sell a laptop. She had been with Daryl Paul earlier on the Sunday um, and it has seen the CCTV, them all looking down the street at Noah going past in the bike. And then she was with a separate four men that possibly attacked Noah. Now, Daryl Paul, this was, um, we'll estimate around quarter to, quarter to six, maybe in the city centre, 10 to six. Daryl Paul, who hadn't been with them um, in the statement about eyewit the eyewitness in the attack, he found Noah's rucksack um, later that evening in, in Great Victoria Street. And that's, there's too many coincidences around this. Daryl Paul, the police went to Daryl Paul's um, residence. They found the rug sack. They found Noah's books. And they did not forensically check Daryl Paul's residence. And Noah was still missing. This, you know... They didn't do any forensics. They found Noah's bag in his apartment. Noah was still missing 
and they didn't even forensically check his apartment. It just, oh, it just. At six eleven as well. Was that the last sighting of Noah? Pardon. At six eleven as the last sighting of Noah. Six eleven was the first time that we were given that Noah was last seen, and I did see the video of um, the last footage. Um, uh, six eleven was the last time he was seen. He was naked. Um, and he was running, he was exhausted. And it was, he was running, exhausted, naked. Um, in an area he didn't know, in a very densely populated street, a cul-de-sac, the top of the street. And it looks like he's going into the back of one of the houses. The time, the time uh, there was another CCTV camera and it showed the penultimate one, the one before he was last seen. It showed Noah cycling up um, a turn off into that street and he looked exhausted then. You know your child, you know, you know, a police officer that doesn't know a child wouldn't know their mannerisms, wouldn't know, you know, Noah was exhausted cycling. And at the same time that Noah turns that corner into that street, there's a silver car that turns the same time. The police have come back with the, the last CCTV timing from 6.11. They've cut it down three times from 6.11 to 6.08 to 6.03 and on the pathology report it says 6.05 so four times this time has been changed um, and to me that means it cuts down any time where anybody could have um, seen anything well could have maybe told Noah to take his clothes off or, you know, came into contact with Noah to take his clothes off. Now, as you said about seeing anything, there are two eyewitnesses that we know of on that street. And remember, it was a sunny day. Um, one eyewitness, they're both mothers. One of the eyewitnesses... Um, says that she's seen Noah cycle naked up the street. Um, and she thought it was a Father's Day prank. Um, she goes out of the house and she sees two men at the top of the street. Noah cycling towards these two men. Now, I've said, and I will continue to say, you do not have to touch a child Noah wouldn't have been streetwise. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been around. Men would have been teachers. To, you know, that would have been authority figures to Noah. If two scary men stand and shout at a child, get up the street now, take your clothes off, they don't have to touch that child. That child's going to be terrified. Um... She didn't phone the police until 30 hours later. And she says it was a Father's Day prank. She has said she didn't speak to anybody else in the street. At the very top of the street um, where the CCTV footage was seen, at the cul-de-sac, another mother looked out her window and she seen Noah naked. And she thought it was her next door neighbour doing a Father's Day prank. They both said they thought it was a Father's Day prank, yet neither of them were meant to have spoken to each other. Um, this area that Noah was last seen in, he wouldn't even have known that area. He's never, ever had any reason to be in that area. Noah's always with me or with his friends from school doing activities. He would never have known that area. Belfast, as most people would know, is um, 
divided Catholic Protestant and thank goodness things have gotten better. Um, but it's still, there's still a divisive element. There's still a minority on either side who, um, with Power Muldry still involved. Um, and the area that Noah was last seen in is a loyalist stronghold. Um, Noah was mixed race. Um, that area has has been known to be, and not all, just a minority. Just and I have to stress, it's just a minority, and there's always a minority in either side. Catholic and Protestant are very racist. Um, Um, oh gosh. The uh, prior, a few weeks prior to Noah being attacked, another child from the same school as Noah's was on his bike and um, he was pushed off his bike by a man and about 15 boys attacked this child um, and thank goodness this child knew the area and was a cross country runner and knew where to run to and thank God he got away safe um, there's been other attacks it's the interface is Catholic and Protestant, there's an interface this was called um, and there's been numerous attacks on children there was an attack on a child similar kind of situation to know and I, I like this is what I need people to understand is this child was on a bike um there was a car of young young adults um and an adult and they were trying to attack this child the child cycled away to an area he didn't know and thank god escaped but he didn't know where he was by the end of trying to cycle away and this is my thing is Noah didn't know the area he was in. Noah's, when the police got Noah's electronics devices, they checked all his devices to see his search on Google, everything to see who he had been speaking to, etc. And um, The last search on Noah's uh, laptop before he left the house was Cave Hill because that is where my Noah was going to. Cave Hill to meet his friends. If Noah had a wanted to go to a loyalist area that he didn't know and, and go down a storm drain, he would have been searching for that and there was nothing on Noah's devices to lead the police to believe that he was searching for that. No suspicious phone calls, text messages, nothing like that? Absolutely nothing. Actually, the last we t uh, message he sent on Instagram was to his friend um, with Kiev, question mark, question mark, question mark, Kiev Hill. Um, What's the, does somebody say get hit with a, hit with a car as well? And fell off his bike. So, How true is that? So the CCTV footage that we have seen about uh, Sergeant Muir Clark uh, was the person who came out and made a statement that Noah, on the Wednesday, that Noah um, may have had a concussion because he had fallen and hit his head. The CCTV footage that relates to this statement I've seen and my sister's seen and um, my sister has seen and we can say without a doubt Noah did not hit his head. Um, he got up extremely quickly actually. There's another piece of CCTV footage after that and you can see Noah sort of turning and looking. Um, you know, behind him. Noah had a helmet on him. Um, 
When I had he identified, no, he was covered in mud um, and he looked like he was sleeping. He looked beautiful. I could see his wee braces and all. He just, he looked like he was sleeping. Um, but I couldn't see any bumps or anything. But when, when Noah was in the coffin and I got to see him all cleaned up and with clothes and all on, um, there was on his forehead, it was, um, the circumference of it was 16 centimeters. It was a massive, a massive, um, bruise in there. Well, it was, it wasn't a bruise at that stage because of whatever way but there was a massive um, injury to his head and on the side of his face. Um, and it wasn't from a fall of his bike as Sergeant Muir Clark had put out to the public. I don't know why he said that, but he was being proactive basically because Noah was still missing on the Wednesday and there was no CCTV footage that I have seen to show that Noah hit his head. Um, Muir Clark also said no foul play. Straight away. He had said it. It was very quick. No foul play. With no autopsy or nothing yet. The autopsy, I think, had just been done. But... Uh, you know, no foul play. You haven't even investigated. You've gone, what I believe is the police have gone from my phone call, which I never wanted to make a phone call because it was um, basically admitting to myself, I was trying to be rational, admitting to myself that something was really wrong. At Noah, at quarter to nine or quarter to ten, I phoned the police and I didn't want to phone them because I was outside. I didn't want to walk anywhere in case Noah came from either side. But I phoned the police. I answered the questions. I I went over the past few weeks. Noah was hormonal. He was 14 years old. His mood was up and down like any other 14-year-old. Um, they're taking it from my phone call that Noah, Noah basically went in that storm drain himself. But what I keep pushing to everybody, including my solicitor and barrister, because I need them to understand this is so important. If the police can tell me how Noah knew that storm drain existed at the back of houses, when some people on that street didn't even know that storm drain existed and they lived there 20 years, how did my baby know that storm drain existed and also know that the storm drain was unlocked? How did my baby know that? If they tell me that, if they prove to me that, then I will, and I've said to everybody, I will start listening to what they're saying, but it doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, no one deserves. No one deserves the truth. He's such a beautiful soul. And that they're trying to they're trying to put that narrative in. That no Noah went there intentionally himself. And, Naked. And there's no way. There's no way. So when Noah at 6 or 11, when they say he was cycling naked, how far was that footage to the, the storm drain? It was, in, it was on that street. His pants and his, um, his shorts were never found. And on the Tuesday, I went over, I wanted to go over and I want, his bike had been found on that street. Um, the person that the, the bike was found outside this person's house, it took them, it took them 24 hours to phone the police. 
Um, it took, as I said, the two eyewitnesses 30 hours to phone the police. They could have saved Noah's life, these two eyewitnesses. All they had to do was phone the police and say there's, if it, even that's why I say, even if they were afraid to go out, you know, where did they think Noah was, where did they think Noah was disappeared to? They seen Noah cycle up a, a cold, up to the top of a cul-de-sac. Their parents, where did they think my baby went? Where did they think he went? And they waited 30 hours to phone the police. I had gone over on the Tuesday morning um, to try and see, because they had told me that, you know, it was a small area and there was barbed wire um, and they told me that Noah was naked and they were expecting me to believe that Noah climbed over barbed wire and, you know, or climbed over the backs of about 40 houses, walls, the back gardens. And that's why they couldn't find them. I didn't know about this massive storm drain. I wanted to go over um, and the police wouldn't let me up to search for Noah. So I just shouted out his name because I, I thought, well, if he's, you know, if it's a small area, he has to be in one of the houses. He has to be in one of the houses. They need to start checking the houses. But on that Tuesday, with his clothes, some of his clothes not found, the police let, the police never cordoned the street off for forensics. The police let the bin, the bin lorry in to empty the bins and they wouldn't let me go up and look for my baby. Um, they, you know, there's been a lot of, when Noah was missing, a lot of good people from both sides of the community went out and searched for Noah and the police let them, we, they had such great intentions, I will be forever grateful, but um, the police let them walk over a possible crime scene and contaminate a crime scene. Um, they, um, they never did forensics on any handles of back doors. They... There was, there was four houses out the backs that I heard screaming that night. Um, they never, oh my God. I'm, I'm saying about Noah's clothes not being found. And just after Christmas, the police, the PSNI, Police Service of Northern Ireland, put out on media about a coat that was lost in a pub in the city centre. Now this coat and underneath the now this was put out on media that the police are trying to track down a coat that was lost in a pub in the city centre and they want to reunite the coat with the owner. So there was nothing happened to the owner. Yet they my child was missing and they let the bin lorries go onto that street and they you know they didn't find it's like important to find my my baby's clothes, you know, for forensics. They left what clothes they did find. They left in an unsealed bag um, in the police station that could have been contaminated. That's what they could say happened, an unsealed bag. They left his bike outside one of the buildings in the police station uh, by forensics, you know, fingerprints, the laptop, they they never checked the laptop for fingerprints. You know, they there hasn't been one out of forensics done in Noah's case. Another important point is um well, so the storm drain out the back of these houses, um, the houses, the, there's a couple of houses that look onto that storm drain. And they're telling me that Noah went down that storm drain himself. Um, um, the thing is, is, Noah's scared of the dark. Now, this storm drain was pitch black. And they're telling me that Noah went through a pitch black storm drain, 
950 meters. And to give you some idea, 950 meters is about nine football pitches. And they're telling me Noel went down that storm drain that distance himself around corners. Um, and I would ask the person who's brave enough to go that far down a storm drain to come forward and do it. I asked that the, like, you know, they've never done a reconstruction. The police have never done a reconstruction. We're trying to get a reconstruction done. You know, these are the things that, um, these are the things that should be done when a child's missing. Um, the, the storm drain itself was unlocked, but it was checked just three days prior by the Department of Infrastructure. It was checked three days prior, yet it was unlocked. And they're telling me that Noah knew that storm drain was there and knew that storm drain was unlocked to get in there. Where, was this, where does the storm drain run to? Uh, the storm drain runs, it's um, freshwater seawater. It runs, um, it, uh, it goes quite a distance. Um, the thing, when, when somebody's found drowned, and that's what the pathology report did state that Noah died from drowning, um, the first thing that a pathologist has to do, and I didn't know this, but you learn as you go through the, the whole process, is um, that they have to take a water sample because there's there's things called diatoms. Um, and my solicitor brought that to our knowledge in a meeting with the coroner and the inspector involved in, the, in Noah's investigation. And this was about a month after Noah was found. And he stated it was very important that we get the water sample and straighten, like, like that inspector was sitting across the table from myself, my sister and my solicitor and said, yeah, he, he agreed. Yet it's come to pass that... Noah was found on the 27th of June. It's come to pass that on the 27th of June, the pathologist requested the water sample. And that inspector, who sat across the table from us, he was made aware that water sample was needed and the water sample was never taken. Um, it's important that you have a water sample, as I was saying, because if somebody drowns, you have to make sure that the water they are finding it's is the same in their lungs. Yeah, and it's so it is because it could mean that they may have drowned somewhere else and been placed in in a different water. So it has to correlate. If you haven't got a water sample, you can't. You can't um, say definitively that, that that person drowned in that place. Yeah, a specific spot. But uh, um, this is, it's vitally important in a police investigation when that's the situation to have a water sample. Um, and as we say, you start with incompetence first. But there's so many things, no forensics at all. There's so many things that have been incompetent, but is it incompetence? Because... So when Noah was in the drain, was that not scientifically proven, or science, uh, science behind that, that it was only the feet and the hands that had water? Yeah, um, we have experts, as I said, about the water sample. Um, the experts are trying to ascertain if the Noah's body being that drain for six days, um, how should his body have looked, you know, being in a water, um, submerged in water. Um, 
that we are with the experts investigating that. It seems that, because as I said, I had seen Noah um, and earlier than the gash to his head when he was cleaned up. It, he looked perfect. Um, there was no bloating. Um, he just looked beautiful. Um, but in the pathology report, um, his hands and his feet were the only parts of his body that looked like they had been submerged in water for a period of time. Um, I also have to say that that come to the attention of a newspaper that um, there was two criminals in prison and criminal A divulged to criminal B that he had taken part in the murder of of my son. Um, criminal B, when he got out of prison, he came um, and contacted uh, people within our team and he came of his own accord gave a full statement saying what had um, been divulged by Criminal A. Um, the police never took that serious. Criminal A says that they drowned Noah in a bathtub. Um, uh, they've never they've never been questioned. What? So that's why it's important as well for the water the water sample to have been took for, yeah. from the drain because it, then it may have Match definitely from water yeah. from the bath. Yeah. Um, in the statement from Criminal B, who did come forward, um, he said that Criminal A, who may have taken part in Noah's murder, um, that they had then got uh, paramilitaries. The um, paramilitaries took part in um, getting rid of Noah's body. But the police never took that serious either. They never took it serious. And they haven't taken it. anything that we brought forward to the police. They haven't taken serious. Why do you think they want to cover the whole thing up? Because it can cause a the lot social of... social arrest. Yeah. I do believe um, that... I do believe that that's, that would be the underlying reason that they don't want to deal with nobody wants to nobody wants that to happen and knowing Noah my goodness he would not let that happen he would not have great faith in it. like Noah is such a beautiful soul but I think the police believe that that's what the outcome would be if the if um if a truth came out that's paramilitaries were involved yeah troubles could start again but can I make it really really clear because um, Noah wasn't brought up with a vision like we're all equal and that's how Noah felt as well there are so many amazing people on both sides of the community this is not a um, my talking to you today and me being really honest and truthful about what I I think happened my baby there is a there's more good people in each side of the community and it's just that minority and it's the minority that that you know uh, they poison a, a whole community they you know it's a, it's, it's a minority that I believe may have been involved in my son's death. There's so many unanswered questions for yourself, so many mistakes, so much. Yeah, maybe well, are they mistakes? Stuff and that as well, I get it. And it, like, with the bag as well, was that not near a camera? Did somebody not pick the bag up when they were seen, but yet they never seen the camera with the bag getting put down? So, uh, um, the camera that we were shown, the CCTV footage where you can't, you, um, where the the Noah's um, rucksack rucksack is no longer with him, it's a very bad CCTV 
footage. Um, and, you know, there's the CCTV is vital. Um, it, you know, that would bring everything together because these two men at the top of the street, you know, who were they? Why did they not stop Noah? You know, two men at the top of the street and Noah was naked and these two men, who are they? Who are these two men? You know, um, there has been speculation and we've been told not to speculate, but I'll speculate all I want because I'm Noah's mom and I want justice and I want the truth. Um, there's been speculation that the police went in on the Friday before Noah was found and did this, that area and said to the paramilitary um, organization that if you don't give up Noah's body, then we'll come in and wreck the place, meaning we'll come in, we'll find your drugs, we'll find your prostitution dens. Um, and Noah's body was found then on the Saturday morning. Six days later? Yeah. How is that for a mother? It's a mother's worst nightmare like for those six days. Like, When did it also break in the news? How many days later? The Wednesday we were, on the Tuesday evening, I had requested, well, demanded that um, an inspector come and speak to me because I wanted the houses searched. He came, I videoed him because I needed evidence because I, like, I just... I wanted them to get warrants and get into people's houses and they said there's no way that they could go into people's houses that the only way the only way to go into somebody's house was for me Noah's mommy to ask these people you know these these people the police are public servants you know people pay taxes you know, if anything ever happens, um, that you can trust them to um, do the job they're meant to do. And yet they're saying that I, as Noah's mommy, had a request pe people to open their doors and let the police search. I did put a request out on the police's um the police's Facebook page and I'm wondering did any of those people in, in that cul-de-sac ever open their doors because I know if you've nothing to hide you'll let them go into your attic you'll let them go into every cupboard you'll open your doors as a child you you will do anything you can to help um, I don't know if any of them ever opened their doors I, I, I would like they find that out. Um, on the Wednesday then, we were basically uh, more or less pushed into that um, press, press um, release about um, um, Noah possibly being concussed or Noah, if you're in Sergeant Muir Clark, not understand the type of boy Noah was, put out at the end of the statement, Noah, you're not in trouble. If you're in a friend's house, then um, you're not in trouble, just get in contact. He didn't understand the type of boy Noah was. He wouldn't have been in a friend's house. He he wouldn't, he just wasn't that type of 14-year-old. Is that trying to make out as if it's, it's quite, it happens all the time kind of thing? Well, to me it was, yeah, it was, to me, they didn't understand Noah's character. They didn't, you need to know the character of the child that you're, trying to find they it's come to pass that um an internal police review this means like your best body that you go to the tea room with is going to write a report on your investigation uh, so that review was done within the police um the police service and it came to pass that even your best body police officer has said that Resources were not put into place for a missing child. Um, last, uh, on, in 2020, in the year that Noah went missing, the police service in Northern Ireland, in overtime, paid £32 million in Northern Ireland 
overtime. Now, this is a missing child. My know is a missing child. And they didn't think it important to pay overtime for my child to be found. Yeah, that should be a priority for any missing child. I know. So after the six days, you, did you already have a gut feeling of mother's instincts would have oh. already been? Like you'd have probably felt that, There's like you say, a couple of hours hope. later, but this, when, the six days, when, was it a phone call you got? Um, my sister and I, you know, it's, this is, it's, 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 unless you're in that situation, you'll not understand, you'll do anything. And I contacted a psychic and on the Saturday morning, I went, to, me and my sister went down to a psychic. She's such, you know, she, she gave me great comfort. But, um, she, like she told, she told me lots of things. She says it would be like a jigsaw puzzle, um, but she did say it. She did say that she thought no one was dead, but she said it's so lovely. But it was. <laughs> and, and she was coming up. She, was, she came up in the car with me and my sister, and she was going to do a walk of where she thought Noah. Um, Noah's root was and try and find him. Um, when we got to my apartment, the police were, the liaison officers were sitting waiting and the liaison officers were so cold and callous. And, you know, if I had, if I had heard it from them first, I don't think I could have handled it. But for her, I think, for her to, um, for her to say that to me, um, sort of buffered. She said it so gently and with love, you know. And um, if I had heard it from the police officers, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, she, I've got great faith, um, and she's a very spiritual person. She may be. Uh, she. She gave me some kind of peace that Noah was safe now. And I just think if I had heard it from the police, <laughs> they wouldn't have cared about, you know, how they, they didn't care about how they put it to me, actually. Um, I just stop. How do you think the police have treated this whole case? Um, they, and, um, in the report that I had said about, I had said about the resources not being put in, um, and I had felt that for throughout the time period, and I had put it to the chief constable in questions about manners, and um, he had basically deflected from proper answer, but it did come in, out in that report that that was true. Um, they, you know, there are, like, in the first couple of days before the liaison officers, there was a beautiful Chief Constable Allison, or not Chief Constable, sorry, Constable Allison. She's just so compassionate, and you knew that, she, you know, her, she, she was in the place to help people. Um, I, I've found the higher up that, uh, you know, having to deal with superintendents and chief constables, there's no compassion. They, you know, there there was in the report that says about missing, missing person fatigue, you should never have 
that kind of uh, mentality when a, ch a report comes in of a child missing um, within 72 hours of a child going missing. It's the most crucial hours. Um, and the first night of the search, it was raining, but not heavy. We're in Ireland. The police expect rain. Um, and they called off the search for Noah, knowing that he was naked. They called off the search for Noah because they, they were afraid for the health and safety of their police officers. And it wasn't, it wasn't mountainous terrain. It was back gardens of um, of an urban area, and they called off the police search for my child. And it's in the crucial time period. You know, I'm I have so many issues with the with the Noah's investigation. And as I said before, we'll start with incompetence, but the further I go on, and the more I find out. You know, there's more than incompetence involved. I will say that something that's... You're talking corruption? You know, I'll believe, you know, I'll give you an example now that would make me speculate in that. And how dare anybody say I cannot speculate as Noah's mommy. Um, there's... Uh, a thing that the police can request from court called a public interest immunity certificate. Um, well, I keep hitting it forward. Noah was part of the public. I'm part of the public. Everybody that cares for Noah, Noah's army, it, you know, the people that really support fighting justice for Noah, we're all part of the public. And as I say, it's in all of our interests and in the safety of all our children. I don't want this ever happen to another family, another child. It's all in all our interests that we get the truth for Noah, that, you know, that nothing is hidden. You know, they're saying it was, um, there was no foul play. Then there's no need to hide anything. There's no need to hide anything if you're telling the truth. So why are the police trying to stop me getting information and disclosure. Um, I have, like, you know, professional people, legal people have said that the only reason in Northern Ireland that they'll ever request a public interest immunity certificate is if there's intelligence informers, paramilitaries involved. Um, the information and disclosure I've already got is alarming to me already. So I wonder if that's alarming to me already, what do they not want me to read? You know, um, we'll never be able to get justice for my baby if we don't get all the information, and this is part of the reason, James, that you know that I'm sitting in front of you today, is the, we need to put pressure. It's going to go to the Secretary of State, and he makes a decision if I get that information or not, and I need pressure put, you know, from, from whatever angle that can be put on the Secretary of State that he cannot stop me as Noah's mommy, Noah, was such a beautiful soul like he would have done you know his future you know it, it, he was going to excel in whatever he did in his life and you know his life you know was oh my goodness it, they better give me that disclosure I need to fight them putting that certificate on disclosure for Noah I, I cannot let them, I cannot let them do it because we'll never get answers. What's the police says about the whole investigation? What is their rundown at all, and at all? The police, as I said, the police are going with a narrative, either it's suicide or it's misadventure. They brought in a psychologist who deals with, who's been used before by this coroner, who deals with 
custodial adult suicide. Now, Noah was a child. He was never in prison. And I know for a fact my baby would never leave me or his friends. It, you know, it's so much to live for. Yeah, they brought a psychologist and psychiatrist in and did expert reports um, for the coroner to bring up Noah's mental health. No one ever had any mental health problems. He was never at the doctor. He was at the doctor for a checkup, the register. He was so healthy. You know, they are going down this narrative route and, you know, that that's that's giving them a way out of answering what actually happened, my baby, and just keeping your head. No, I didn't know that storm drain existed, and the storm drain was open. As a mother's instincts and the information that you have, what's your rundown on it all? Oh my goodness, I just believe, and um, I try and block out what I think happened, my baby. Um. But I have to take it because whatever went through, whatever my baby went through, he was alone. He didn't have me. He didn't have me to protect him. And, I, you know, I just, there's, there could be people out there that harmed my baby. And they're still out there. And, you know, I do believe somebody harmed my baby. Okay. I do believe somebody harmed my baby. My, You know, I do believe it. And, that you know, there's been anonymous calls where um, people have said they have information, but they have to keep their family safe first and they've never phoned back. And I know... Um, I would appeal to anybody, you know, I know it would be difficult for anybody because of, you know, there's fear in certain communities because of paramilitaries. But there are ways, my solicitor, like, we will make sure that um, anybody that comes forward with information is kept safe. You know, and, you know, if you have any belief in God, you know, you know, you have to come forward and, you know, how can you live? You know, that Noah was a beautiful child. And I would just pray that somebody's brave enough to come forward and give information and pray and, like, I do you have faith that somebody will do the right thing? And I do understand f the fear, but, you know, nothing will change if, if, you know, if people can't speak up. And, it's, you know, these these paramilitaries are bullies. They, like, they're now, you know, they, they bully their own communities. And I just, I just, yeah, well, the, I just can't take it. And Noah, Noah's life stands for something. And Noah wouldn't take bullies either. And I just think, you know, people are afraid. Don't be afraid. Because, you know, that's what the bullies want. Just. Do you believe Noah was murdered, Fiona? I can't say that word. I believe somebody harmed my baby. I believe somebody harmed my baby. I just don't want to think about it. As a mother, Fiona, like, you're so brave to just keep going and try and find answers and to not give up. And for me, there's question marks. Listen, I'm not a police officer. I'm, I, I don't know all the answers, but for me, looking at the outside and hearing what you're saying and watching certain videos, there's question marks everywhere. Is it, could it be a potential that if Noah was killed... And it was from a certain group that if that was true, then it could potentially start riots and chaos again. But this is it. Um, there was two meetings that myself and my sister, when we were solicitor, 
Um, oh, there was one main meeting where we had 80 questions for the inspector involved and there was investigation in the coroner. Um, they never answered our questions, but they made sure they put it across to us because media have not been taking this on. It's been a media blackout and that's why I've come to you and I'm so grateful for, you know, your platform for Noah's Voice. Why is that? The media, you know, have Northern told, Ireland... Have they been told to be quiet or do they just think that you're just a mother grieving that... This was this, this was the thing at the start is Sergeant Muir Clark put out, let the family grieve. Grief is a lifetime. Grief. Grief is a lifetime. When, when did he think I... You know, my grief would stop. This is never going to stop. Yeah, as sad as it is, you'll be with that till the day you die, Fiona. But he, what I believe he was trying to do was distance the public's um, want for answers um, by respectfully letting the family grieve, you know, and then slowly wipe it all under the carpet. And I just thought, you know, so, you know, it just clicked with me one day. It was like about eight weeks and I just thought, they're doing nothing. They're doing absolutely nothing. And then it just clicked. You're trying to, you're trying to wipe us under the carpet. When we were in the meeting, we've had to put out our own social media platforms because, as I said, the media are, are not taking it on because it would cause social unrest. Um, the... The chief in, or the inspector and the coroner twice in the meeting says, could you put a statement out in your, on your platforms, more or less wording it so that there wouldn't be social unrest? Like that's all their concern. You know, the greater good. Well, I'll tell you this. My Noah is my everything. And their, their consequences, for, you know, let them deal with that. The, their public servants put their resources and the you know whatever you know, the, my thing as Noah's mommy is I'll not stop and I will I will say what I have to say to get answers for Noah you know the, the, and the media I'm just absolutely disgusted at the media so disgusted has anybody ever came forward and tried to silence yourself, you wanna told you to be quiet or threatened you with any court papers yourself? Oh, well, the coroner and the uh, attorney general, like it seems that I can be in contempt of court, but then a newspaper article um, came out with the same information I was going to put out and were they in contempt of court? So but why, I'll, I'll be in contempt of court. So why is that? Just to silence you? To try and make you forget it as if you're just going to forget Try and make me forget. Your 14 son has been taken away from you, but I'm you're not just going to forget. accept it. Of course you're not. Like, you're clearly a fighter and the time is now to try and get the answers that you want. And to, like you say, you'll be living with this pain the rest of your life. That's, you, you know this yourself, but yeah. a bit of closure would take away some sort of pain where you know deep inside that there's, there's so many unanswered questions there. Like, it must be such a difficult thing for you 18 months on and you've never really, it's just like you're going round in circles. It's, it's like they want to put you around in circles so that you spiral out of control. And let me tell you, there's many a day I have spiraled out of control. Um, and I probably will again. But you know what? I'll still I'll get myself grounded again and just come back. They will not break me or my sister in this fight or Noah's army. Like there's a lot of very passionate people. Noah is, a, is just is such a beautiful, beautiful soul. And we don't want this ever to be repeated on another family. If the, We just, they're not going to break me. Yeah, I don't want to miss anything out here. So, is there anything that you want to touch on as well? Um, because it's important for people watching. That I know a lot of people might be scared to come forward and give you answers, but is there anything that we've missed out? Anything that we can? 
so much information on this and I know like I it'd be very hard to keep track of what I've just said but um it is it, it really is there's two main aspects to me wanting to talk today is to put pressure on on this public interest immunity certificate never getting the light of day because Otherwise, I'll not get the light of day on disclosure and on answers. That that can't happen. Like there's legacy families with, that have, you know, they'll never get answers. I'm not letting that happen for Noah. Um, and the second thing is just appealing, appealing to anybody, anybody with any information. Oh my goodness, please come forward. Just, they may think it's, this is what I keep saying is they may think it's insignificant. But see that one little jigsaw piece? It could, uh, it could add on to something I already know. And it could be so significant. You know, even if you think it's so insignificant, I, I just come forward. Like to my solicitor, um, Niall Murphy at KRW. Um, KRWS KRW Law, KRW Law sorry um, just any 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 type of information First of all for coming on today and sharing your story you're a brave brave woman clearly mm -hmm. a fighter anything I can ever help if I've got your back 100% thank you how can people contact you if they've got information or wanted to tell you something um, Twitter um we have platforms, or my Twitter platform. Um, maybe I can pass it on. Of to course, you can. You can leave that in the, in yeah. the description. Twitter stuff like that for people. Yeah. You don't know who's got information out there. And as you say, people are scared. People are scared to maybe give information because it potentially risk to their own life. And but as a fourteen-year-old kid missing, whether it's uh, it's racism involved or the religion or whatever it is that there's, there's somebody's, got, have somebody's got answers where it's a baby that's missing a mother's mm. clearly distraught and um this is one of the reasons why you're here today so we can maybe get some closure as i say you don't know who's watching but would you like to finish up on anything fiona just um oh, just I'm, I'm just grateful for this platform that says the media are not giving no a voice and um, Noah's voice deserves to be heard. So, yeah. Fiona, well, come on today, tell me your story. God thank bless you. you and anything I can help with in the future, I'm only a phone call away. Thank you, James. Take care, God bless. Thank you.